Hi, everyone, and welcome to the webinar on Caribbean benthic mapping, a transformative tool for ocean conservation. This webinar is co-sponsored by the Nature Conservancy's Caribbean Division and the Reef Resilience Network. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Elizabeth Shaver. I am the science lead for the Reef Resilience Network, and I will also be the host for today's webinar. So today we are lucky to have three speakers who will provide a background on the Nature Conservancy's Caribbean Division and its work to create these benthic habitat maps and how they can be accessed and used. Our first speaker today is Donna Blake, who is the Jamaica Program Director for the Nature Conservancy's Caribbean Division. Our second speaker is Dr. Steve Schill. He is the lead scientist for the Caribbean Division. Um, he was also the principal investigator and the lead in um, developing these Caribbean benthic maps. And then our final speaker today is Valerie McNulty. She is a spatial ecologist for the Caribbean Division, and she was also a lead developer on the Caribbean benthic map project as well. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn things over to Donna. Thank you and good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My task is to explain a little bit about the Nature Conservancy Caribbean Division. So I will let you know, um, many of you are probably familiar, but there are a few who may not be. Um, the Nature Conservancy is an international NGO. We work in over 70 countries and we've been in the Caribbean for over 40 years. Um, we're tackling some of the toughest problems facing people and nature today and working with partners such as yourselves to replicate good ideas, restore many places and improve people's lives. We're grounded by local experience and we use science, real world solutions and partnerships to support local needs and in some cases to guide and support regional and global decision making. Next slide, please. So this is our vision. We envision a resilient Caribbean where both people and nature can thrive. Next slide. Um, we work in 17 countries in the Caribbean. We have offices in six, six offices and about 70 staff. So you see that ambitious mission we have, as you can imagine, with a small cadre of staff, we must and do work in partnership. And our partners include government, civil society organizations, private sector, multilateral organizations, among others, each bringing our own skills and talents to the collaboration in all of the countries in which we work. I think you have joined us today because you continue to be interested in and collaborating with us and supporting our work as we are trying to support the work in the various countries we work in. Next slide. Uh, so the Caribbean is home to about 44 million people, as you'll see here, 70% of whom live on the coast, over 12,000 fish and other marine species, 10% of the world's coral reefs, and 12% of the world's mangroves. And these are, this is not insignificant, but this has led, her, led us to develop some priorities in the Caribbean. Next slide, please. Um, so, We've come up with these priorities in dialogue with national governments and other stakeholders. And through dialogue with partners such as yourselves, you'll see here ensuring healthy and productive oceans, safeguarding against the impacts of climate change, protecting, restoring, and monitoring coral reefs. I'd like to move on to why, why are we having this webinar today? What is the Caribbean benthic habitat map all about? Next slide. Um, so benthic can be de defined as the ecological region at the lowest level of a body of water. It starts at the shoreline and continues down until it reaches the floor, encompassing the sediment surface and the subsurface layers. For our purposes in the Caribbean, that is, coral reefs, sand, hard bottom, and seagrass. The maps we have developed show the marine and coastal benthic habitat for the entire Caribbean. So 
these maps give us some detailed knowledge of the marine coastal benthic habitats throughout the Caribbean. And what, what, why is that important? So we see it as aiding in national decision making for sustainable use of coastal resources, including prioritizing areas for restoration and or protection, including sites for climate change adaptation activities that will reduce the vulnerability to impacts, especially on the coast. We also see that it can provide a comparison and information sharing across the region, um, guiding collaborative actions, especially with regard to impacts on the coast. We do see the um, including livelihood options best suited for habitats and conditions and how are we optimizing sites for coral restoration, for example, identifying the best location for marine protected areas. The kind of information that is in the maps will allow us to have that kind of, um, have the requisite information to make some informed decisions. So really um, these maps are to help us come to some good decisions about what we should, could, ought to be doing in the marine and coastal environment. Next slide. Um, so you heard the other presenters, Dr. Steve Schill and Valerie McNulty will be talking about um, the methodology, explaining the functionality of the maps and the platform. And so our purpose here today is really to share with you that and to hear from you. We need to understand what value do you see in these maps? How can we make them accessible and useful to you? Um, I will note right away the maps are open access and available to everyone for use and TNT is happy to provide support and technical capacity to help partners across the region to use these products. Next slide, please. And I would, will end by thanking and, and acknowledging um, some of our main partners in this work so far. Um, we have the Arizona State University, the Center for Global Discovery and Conservation Science, Planet, and Vulcan. Um, and I know Dr. Steve Schill, who I'm gonna hand over to in a second, will go into um, other partners and supporters of this work. And I thank you. Thanks so much, Donna, for setting the, the stage so well for this webinar. And now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Steve Schill, who's going to share how these maps were made and um, a lot of the details that went into creating them and how you can use them. Hey, everyone, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. <clears throat> okay, great. Well, thanks, Donna. I'm going to open up my presentation. Hopefully that's coming over. Um, is my video coming? There we go. Okay, let me move this over. Um, thanks, Donna. Uh, I was, it, it's been amazing to see the transformation in, in Jamaica over the years. Uh, Jamaica set up a lot of these fish sanctuaries and to see some of the, the fish biomass return. Um, I've been to some of these fish sanctuaries and it's just, it's really amazing what, what nature will do when you give it a chance, when you manage for an area, for an objective. And uh, that's what these maps are all about. We started, the Nature Conservancy started uh, in the Caribbean many, many years ago. Uh, one of the first projects I was able to be involved with was the Caribbean Ecoregional Plan that we did more than 20 years ago. Uh, well, it's probably about 15 years ago. And, and that plan was to identify the most important areas to protect. And we looked at the marine area and both the terrestrial and the freshwater as well. But for the marine area, it was difficult to get data on these habitats. Uh, the Caribbean is an incredibly complex place. It's very connected. Uh, in order to do these models, you need data that's consistent. And we found some areas were mapped better than others. Um, there's many, many countries you have to work with. Uh, the only other region in the world that compares is the Mediterranean, where you have so many countries, an incredibly ecologically connected place. And so this, this is a challenge. And we've always had a struggle trying to get good data. And it's always been an objective to map these habitats uh, in a way that we could better represent uh, the, the underwater features. And a lot of times when we do this, 
We are mapping conservation features, things that we set goals for and things that we really care about. Uh, we map the threats to these features. And then we also map where are the managed areas, the protected areas. And so we've been working on all of those. And I would like to present a little bit about uh, the work of creating these, these features, which, which are the, you know, the habitats in the shallow zone uh, up to 30 meter depth. And we can use satellite imagery to do this. And before this point, we've relied on global data sets. And here on this slide, you can see uh, on the far left, you can see the planet image. And I'll talk a little bit more about the, the mosaic and all the work that went into that. That took us over a year to develop a mosaic that we could classify. And getting a good base map is the foundation of all good mapping exercises when you're doing remote sensing. So we took a lot of care and effort into doing that. Um, in the middle, you can see the millennial reef maps. These are global maps. And they were the first attempt to use the global Landsat mosaic to, to identify uh, reef areas. And those have served uh, a great utility over the years. Now the Co Allen Coral Atlas is bringing that from a 30 meter resolution down to a four meter resolution. And I'll talk a little bit about the differences between our regional products and uh, the global products. And then what you see on the right are the benthic maps that we've been working on. And these also are using Dove satellite imagery. And we used a lot of uh, automated routines and a lot of expert input and manual uh, fine tuning to develop these maps. So I just wanted to kind of set the stage on, on what these maps are. Um, let's keep going. So we have, over the years, we have tried to use different types of remote sensing platforms to answer different questions. And, and I, I teach a remote sensing class, um, uh, an evening class. And with my students, I'm always telling them, you know, you have to pick the right platform for the question you're, ans you're asking. A lot of people think, you know, they have to have the highest spatial resolution for everything they're doing, or they have to have as many bands as possible. But that's not necessarily the case. You have to choose the platform that answers your question within the budget that you have. And there are different solutions to doing this. With satellites, we can map very large area. It's a very uh, broad uh, swath that, that and, and it's, the data is collected at one time. And we can take multiple uh, scenes and mosaic them together, uh, use a color target to balance those, those scenes so we don't have seam lines. Um, you can use Global Airborne Observatory for uh, detecting things like live coral. We can't detect live coral, percent live coral from space. And we're working on that. People like Greg Asner is working on doing that, but we just don't have the, the spectral uh, capabilities to do that from space. We can do it from an imaging spectrometer uh, on an on airplane or on a drone, but we can't do it from, from today's current satellites. That's really difficult. Uh, we can use aerial drones to, to map smaller areas, uh, two to three square kilometers. We can get uh, centimeter level pixels and we can do a lot of interesting things like mapping species because we can see them in the shallow areas. If we get a calm day when the sun is at a low angle, we can see underwater and we can, we can detect the actual uh, colonies. And then we can use things like uh, close proximity photogrammetry and uh, divers with cameras. And we can take photo mosaic, create photo mosaics from stereo photos and even go down to the, see the individual polyps. So there's a lot of different scales that we can look at and we can answer different questions uh, based on this. So the Dove satellites, um, let me give you a little background. So these were, these were created uh, by a, a NASA scientists who started their own company uh, they said, we can get uh, satellites in space in a much cheaper way. We could, with the technology we have, we can build these much smaller. We can put them onto a rocket, wherever that rocket is launched, and we can create a constellation uh, that can image the entire Earth every day. And the only way you can do that is to have a lot of satellites. And you can see they're, they're lined up as a string of pearls. There's, there's hundreds of them. And uh, they essentially uh, 
uh, are tracking in a uh, near polar orbit. And the goal of this company was, was to map the entire Earth every day. And they did it within five years, an amazing accomplishment. They now are launching the Super Doves. The, the, the original Dove constellation, uh, they're, they're starting to phase out, but they're starting to introduce the Super Doves, which have higher fidelity in the image. Uh, they have more bands. Uh, they're packing more uh, technology into these satellites that are the size of a loaf of, a loaf of bread. They're very small. Um, just two weeks ago, they launched 43 new Super Doves. And uh, they, I'm looking at some of the imagery uh, just this last week, and it's looking really good. Um, our ability to map corals is, is only going to go up uh, from space. So that's, that's exciting. So let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the mosaic, because these Dove satellites have a very small footprint. When they take a picture, you're only looking at about 20 by 7 uh, kilometers. And that's the area that, that the, the scene covers. And so you have to take thousands of these to cover an area like the, the Caribbean. So we went through a process of, of selecting these scenes based on optimal conditions of seeing through water. Obviously, we didn't want any clouds. Uh, we wanted low sun glint so we could see through the water. We wanted low turbidity. So we, we selected these. We used an automated method. And then we went through and hand selected ones that didn't fit, that weren't uh, fit the criteria. And we came up through a process. This is the original surface reflectance data. And then we, we ran it through a normalization. And then we ran it through another uh, algorithm that did a seam line removal and a used a color target uh, detection from the MODIS sensor on the Terra and Aqua satellites to, to kind of remove those scenes. And then we finally arrived at a manual, uh, at a final product where we did some manual corrections to, to get it to a point where you couldn't see any seam lines. So this was the original. A compilation of scenes, and this is the final one. And this was really important to be able to map across uh, the whole area uh, without having seam lines. And still, we we did have seam lines that we did have to have to correct uh, through the classification process. Process. So this was all done with uh, scientists from Arizona State, Dave Knapp, uh, Joe uh, Kington, and Trevor McDonald at Planet. They helped us uh, do this work, but it took over a year to finally get a product that we could, we could actually uh, use. And you can see here, here's a little animation. Uh, we're gonna zoom into St. Croix and look at some of the reefs here. You can see some of the detail. Uh, we're really interested in seeing through the water column, seeing these features uh, out to 30 meter depth. That's the maximum depth that we can, we can see from space in clear water conditions. But you can clearly see the, the reef crest here, the, the fore reef and the back reef, the lagoon area with the seagrass beds. And this is what we needed. Uh, we need this kind of map to be able to um, map the features that, that we all care about and we want to protect. Uh, another product that was developed parallel was the geomorphic zone map. And this is important because this helps identify uh, biological, ecological areas that are unique to certain species. Uh, in, the sh in the sheltered areas, and, and I'm talking to reef managers and reef experts, so you all know, uh, you know the importance of these, these geomorphic zones. We have seagrass that grow in these sheltered lagoons. It's important to know where these reef crests are uh, because certain species uh, grow in those areas. Uh, Palmata love those, those high energy zones. Uh, we want to know where these these four reef areas are and then where the shelf is. And so these areas were really important to, to map out to help with the classification process. And here are some examples showing the, the reef crest. This is planet dove imagery, uh, mapping out these areas where the, the back reef, the reef crest and the four reef area is. And we use the original uh, geomorphic zone to, to guide the classification of these areas. You can see these, these areas um, well, in this, this example, we have the spur and groove. So this, this is going seaward, and then we have the fore reef, the reef crest, and this is the back reef. We can see the, the, uh, the lagoon area here where the seagrass is growing. And here you can see the, the spur and groove that's easily identified from the forest until it drops off into the deeper ocean, and we can map those areas out.
So we had to work with a lot of reef experts to identify what could we really map from this, from this, this imagery. You know, the more classes you try to map, the more you, you might uh, create errors and, and your accuracy may go down. And so we, we decided we worked a lot with uh, the folks at uh, Allen Coral Atlas and, and what they decided they could map. Um, we talked with a lot of Caribbean experts and we finally came up to this level two that we felt confident we could, we could map. Now, this is all dependent on the quality of the image, uh, the signal to noise ratio in the image, um, uh, the number of bands. And we only had the three bands, blue, green, and red that we could work with. So we had to, to carefully choose this and do some testing. And we finally decided that, that these are the map, these are the categories that, that we, could, we could map with the data. Now, satellites like Worldview 2, Worldview 3, which have more bands, they have five bands in the visible range, and those are able to, to detect features underwater. You can, you can do more. And, and the important thing is uh, you need good field data to be able to train these algorithms. But here are some examples of the different uh, benthic uh, habitat types that we mapped. We've done a lot of video transects that are GPS referenced over many areas. And these were important to guide the algorithm to be able to identify uh, where these features are. These each have a unique spectral profile and we can use that information to delineate. We used a lot of uh, field data. Here's an example of collecting uh, photos that are very precisely uh, mapped to a coordinate using uh, real-time kinematic uh, GPS. So these photos are down to centimeter level. And we use these to uh, identify different types of habitats and, and it really helped guide the process. So the two important ingredients in, in creating these maps were a good base map, a good image base map, and then field data. So let's talk a little bit more about the, the classification process. So uh, the surface re reflectance products that you see there, uh, letter A, uh, that was the result of that mosaic that I talked about. And then we had to create a land uh, shallow ocean uh, mask. And we used the, the geomorphic zones to do that, that were digitized. And then from the surface reflectance, we could use an adaptive uh, algorithm that was tuned uh, to estimate depth based on the water, the, the light attenuation. And so in shallow areas, reflectance looks different than in darker areas or in deeper areas. And, and so we could model, we worked with Dr. Zhue uh, Li at Arizona State University to develop a a, be, a bathymetry map, a depth map across the whole Caribbean. And, and we published a paper on that last year uh, and we can accurately estimate to within uh, a root mean square error of about two meters uh, with this depth algorithm. And we can accurately estimate out to about 10 to 12 meters. Beyond that depth, it starts, the accuracy starts to degrade because the signal, the surface reflective signal isn't as, as strong. And so this was very important to map uh, these benthic habitats out to about 12 meters depth. Uh, we use this to identify individual coral reefs at a, at a four meter resolution. So that's, that's the bathymetry classification that you see there. And that product is also available. So we have the benthic maps and we have the, the bathymetry classification. So we, when we did this workflow, we did it in parallel tracks. We had areas that were less than 12 meters that we had the RGB values, the spectral reflectance and the depth values. And we were able to use both of those plus the geomorphic zone to identify these classes. And areas beyond the 12 meter contour, we only had the RGB to rely on. And so we identified things like uh, deeper hard bottom, uh, whether it was dense with algae or sparse uh, with algae. And that was based on the RGB reflectance patterns. And we finally compiled these together, did manual correction and came up with a, with a final map. And one of the processes we used was uh, a technique called parental guidance, where we used the original geomorphic zones as a guide. And then we used a process called seeding where we could let the feature grow beyond these boundaries 
to identify certain things like the back reef and the fore reef. And that re helped us refine this boundary and make it uh, more accurate, as you can see here in these in, in C and D, where it actually grows beyond that boundary and creates a boundary that represents where the actual uh, boundary is. So here's some uh, final products. This is Turks and Caicos. Uh, you can see the, the, the distribution of these different habitats, the seagrass, dense versus sparse seagrass, the sandy bottom. And then if we zoom in to, to an area in Grace Bay on the northern side of Caicos Island, you can see the, the, uh, the planet dove imagery on the left and the derived classification on the right. You can see that reef crest that was mapped, the back and fore reef. You can see the, the patch reefs, the fringing reefs. You can see the area of spur and groove that was identified and the dense and the sparse seagrass. And, and, we, and we tried to do this across the, the whole insular Caribbean uh, using a consistent method. And, and uh, we finally arrived at a product. We've done some, some fine tuning of this product. Um, Val's gonna uh, tell you about where to get this data and the tool that it that it lives at, um, but you can you can explore these data sets. Um, we're trying to collect feedback. Uh, we've already integrated some of some of the feedback that we've received since we released these maps in December. But we really want to get this product into your hands so that you can use it. This is the foundation to do a lot of important work like marine spatial planning, uh, identifying areas uh, to restore. Um, I was just talking to someone in the Dominican Republic. Um, uh, they're they're uh, taking care of some manatees uh, that were injured, and they're looking for areas to get seagrass. And so they said, "Steve, can you give can you send me the shapefile of of seagrass that you map because we want to uh, know where to to harvest some seagrass to feed the the manatees." So there's all sorts of applications that we can use these data for. So um, and you can visualize in the portal. You can visualize the the coral reefs versus the full wall-to-wall -wall, uh, classification. So with that, um, I think uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Val. All right, I'm gonna take over the screen share. Here we go, okay. Um, so as Steve mentioned, I'm gonna be going over the Caribbean Marine Maps uh, data portal. Um, so this, this website is the homepage for the Nature Conservancy's work on benthic habitat mapping in the Caribbean. Um, we've tried to compile everything that we've developed into one place um, with information on how it was created, what it can be used for, um, there are web maps where you can access the data directly. You can download the data for use in GIS analyses. Um, and again, you can, I know we've covered a lot of it in this webinar, but if you um, need a refresher, you can come back here and um, there's clear, it provides clarity on that why we need different levels of data and then also what it can be used for. Um, so the first three story maps here take you straight to data and technology. Um, and then the last two is where you can get context and then examples of applications that have already, these have already been used for. Okay, so to get started, you can click on the get started button and it will bring you directly to the Caribbean wide benthic habitat maps that Steve described. Um, again, these maps can be used for marine spatial planning, um, climate adaptation projects, ecosystem service modeling and more. Um, so you can interact with the maps directly in this map portal window here, or you can click this button to download the GIS layers. And that will bring you to this survey 123 form um, where we ask that you fill out your name, your affiliation, um, what you'll be using these maps for, and then sign our virtual data agreement. And when you click submit on this form, it will bring you to a page with direct download link options. Um, so far, since we launched these maps about two months ago, 68 users have downloaded these data sets for a variety of uses. Um, and we, we love this forum because it's also interesting for us to hear what people are using these maps for. Um, so some examples of that have been more simple, such as GIS trainings, um, PDF maps, uh, diver research planning, uh, calculations of different habitat types within different countries, navigation and planning for sailors to avoid impacts to coral reefs um, and environmental and climate change education. 
We've also heard from people that they'll be using these data sets for more complex modeling. Um, so that includes blue carbon storage analysis, uh, calibration and validation of global benthic habitat products, ecosystem service models, um, prioritization of climate resilient reefs, national ecosystem assessments, coastal protection modeling, and research on shark ecology and habitat uses. So it's a pretty extensive list. And then even beyond that, um, there's some management and planning uses that have been noted here, such as watershed management planning, marine protected area assessments, conservation efforts, um, environmental impact assessments for planned developments, and marine spatial planning. Um, so it's really interesting for us to hear from you all what you'll be using these maps for. And I think actually we're going to pull you at the end of my presentation. Um, so this is where you can download the data. And then moving back to the story map, you can access the maps directly through this window. Um, you can either use the window embedded here or you can click this button to pop it out into a new page just so you can get a better view. Um, this drop down menu here allows you to see the whole region at once or just a specific country. And actually, if you choose a country from the list, the pie chart of proportions and areas will update here. On the right, we have a legend um, of the different habitat classes. And then there's this link that will bring you to a PDF. Um, and this document describes how we are defining these different classes based on field data and satellite imagery. You can go back to a country. There we go. Um, you can view all the habitats at once, like Steve mentioned, or you can just look at coral. Oops. Or you can just look at seagrass. Um, you can also adjust the transparency of the layer so you can see the underlying satellite imagery to do a comparison. Um, and then as you're panning around the map, you can actually click on different points to see the latitude, longitude, and the habitat class at that location. Um, and you can also query the map. So this, this is a community in Jamaica called Old Harbor Bay. Um, and if I wanted to know how much coral reef is within 10 kilometers of this community, I can just click on the coast. I set this to coral reef and then I'll just type in 10 here and hit enter. And then this calculation will automatically update right here. So there are 26 square kilometers of reef within 10 kilometers of that community. Um, and if I want to see a visualization of that buffer, I can hover over the layer window here and then just turn this checkbox on. Sorry, Val, really quickly. Will you, um, can you uh, just slow down just a little bit for the in interpreters? Yeah, sure, no problem. Thanks. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. Um, so right here, this layer window is where you can turn those buffers off and on. Um, each time that you change the habitat or you change the buffer radius, a new um, buffer will appear in that layer window. Um, and you can just turn them off and on using these checkboxes. And if you type in a radius here and you don't get um, an area calculation immediately, that probably means that you've indicated too large of a radius. OK, um, if you're a local expert, we also need your help to refine our maps. Um, so we intend for these to be living maps that we'll be updating over time, as Steve mentioned, um, to inform better decision making. And, and when we do those updates, we'll post those new maps on this portal. So to provide feedback, you can click on the links on the left here, or actually this is an update we just made. You can just scroll down on the same page and that feedback web map is right here. Um, and I'll be going over how you can use this web map to provide feedback, but if you need a refresher, there's a training video linked here um, where I'll walk you through the same information. So on this web map, um, again, you can interact with it here or you can pop it out using this arrow. You want to start by clicking on the content tab 
um, and you'll see that this dev feedback polygons layer is activated. Um, you don't want to turn that off because that is how you will provide feedback. And then we have these maps split by country or even sometimes within a country split into zones. Um, and that's really just to speed up your load times when you're working on this. So you just want to turn on the country that you're interested in reviewing. You can use these buttons to zoom in. Um, and this map actually is using vector data, so it takes a little bit longer to load than the app above, which is why we've separated them. So you can see it starts out a little bit pixelated and then eventually um, the full resolution comes through. You can also click on the legend here um, to be reminded of the different habitat classes. And you can change the base map here. Um, and again, go back to the content tab to see which layers you have turned on. So as you're panning around the map, if you find an error, um, you can click on edit on the top left. And then this feedback polygon layer will appear, um, which is the only layer that we have editable. So you just click on that to activate it. Um, then you can just start clicking on the map to circle the error that you found and double click to finish. So once you've drawn a polygon, um, this text window will appear where you can type your name your affiliation and a description of the error you found. Um, and we ask that you please be as detailed as possible when you describe the error. So you could say something like, this area is mapped as seagrass, but um, there's a coral reef here. And then once you're done filling this out, you just click close to finish. Um, and you can draw as many polygons as you want during one session and they'll be immediately visible to you as well as anyone else who is providing feedback at the same time, um, which is helpful to our team so that errors aren't identified um, repeatedly. If you accidentally draw a polygon and you didn't mean to, you can click on it and then just click delete and it'll be immediately uh, disappear for you and anyone else. Um, so our team will periodically download this polygon layer so that we can make updates to the maps. Um, and as Steve mentioned, we actually did an update this week. So um, we'll be updating that on the app and the feedback map here, but it's actually already up for download. So if you've downloaded them previously, um, you might want to return and download them again. And um, we're still figuring out the best way to notify everyone of updates, but I think for this first round, I'll send I'll send everyone an email who has already downloaded them. Um, another way to provide feedback is to fill out the survey that will be circulating at the end of this webinar. Um, and I just wanted to reiterate that this tool is really for you all on this call. Um, so if there are any ways we can make it better or more useful for you, um, I really appreciate that feedback. I know I've heard from a few people already that um, for example, KMLs are more useful so they can look at things in Google Earth. Um, so that kind of feedback is really helpful to us. So I'll turn it back over to Liz. Great, thanks so much, Steve and Val. That was really um, interesting and really useful, especially to see how the maps can be accessed and downloaded and validated. Um, so at this point, We'd love, like to transfer things over to a question and answer session. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and um, start with a couple questions that we got in the Q&A box. The first one um, is, is there any work being done in Oyster Bay in Falmouth, uh, <laughs> Jamaica, regarding bathymetry, benthic habitats, um, and the relation to bioluminescent dinoflagellate abundance? I don't know, Steve or Valerie. Yeah, in Falmouth, they, they put a, a new port up there. Uh, maybe Donna has a little bit, little bit more information. I don't, I don't know of any specific uh, activities that are going on. Uh, I know some Jamaican colleagues that, that uh, may know, but Donna, do you, do you know of any, any of those activities? 
Sorry, I'm not aware of what uh, might be happening with regard to Oyster Bay and Falmouth at this time. I was hoping, I was looking to see if there were any um, Jamaican colleagues on the participant list, and there are. And so perhaps if anyone has information on that, they could um, raise their hand or identify themselves in some way. So I'm, I'm not aware at this time of anything. Yeah, but would be would be happy to receive feedback on. Uh, we can provide depth data, model depth data for that area and the the benthic habitat products, uh, and we'd love to to get feedback on on the accuracy of of this area. So, I know that that there's been a lot of disturbance there with with the port that they've built. So that's probably what they're studying. Great, thank you. Um, so if we have anyone that wants to follow up, they can do that um, by raising their hand or, or sending a, um, a text or, or in the chat box or in the Q&A box. Um, the next question that we have um, is uh, where can we access the bathymetry map? Okay, so we haven't, we haven't put the, that on the portal yet. That, the plan is to get that on there eventually. Uh, so Val and I will work on that um, and try to get it up probably in the next uh, month or two. Um, yeah, I think but, um, you can expect to see it in the same spots at some point. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're going to be doing some uh, additional mapping on mangrove this year and refining that with this dove imagery and making that available. And also we want to get the, the uh, the bathymetric products. I think on the Allen Coral Atlas, they have Sentinel derived at a 10 meter resolution uh, depth. Uh, but we're going to we're going to try to get the Dove products, um, the Dove bathymetry up there in the next month or two. So stay tuned. We'll we'll work on that. But if you need a specific area, you can reach out to us and we'll we'll pull that and send it to you. Great. Okay. Next question. This is um, from Anseleno Davis from the Bahamas. Um, is there any funding for student training to integrate these maps into local university programs? Um, he's asking particularly with in-water observation or with GIS. Hey, Lino. Yeah, good to hear from you. Yeah. Uh, I don't know of any funding. Uh, for student trainings, um, you know, with if there are opportunities to do uh, webinars, we we can do that. Um, you know, we can try to organize something to help. Um, I don't know of any funding sources uh, to be able to integrate these maps into local university programs, but that that's a great application. Uh, trying to educate and and make people aware of the technology to do this type of work and, and you know, provide training. So uh, reach out to us and, and if there's an opportunity for us to, to do a training, you know, we, we can do that. Uh, maybe we can collaborate with multiple universities and do it all at once, but uh, yeah, that's, that's a great use of the data. Anyone have anything else to say on that? Um, we've also been working on an interactive online course with the Allen Coral Atlas. That, oh, yes. um, we can share the link for that. Yes, that's a great that's a great uh, curriculum uh, that is very basic and walks you through the whole process. And that's and they've got two lessons and there's a third lesson that is going to be coming out soon. So yeah, thanks, Val. That's a good good resource. Thanks for mentioning that. Um, the that third lesson is. Um, I believe already online um, or just came out online. Um, we have a hand up from someone in the audience, um, Maria Jose Fernandez. Do you want to go ahead and uh, I'm going to allow you to talk if you can unmute yourself um, and ask your question? Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Um, my question is with regards, I love the idea of updating the map as it goes. Is there any way to add, like, are there any plans to like make a yearly report on the map so that we can use these maps as baselines or access like the 2000, like the 2020 version of this map in 
2025? Yeah, we're, um, we're working on a, uh, an article that is going to be submitted very soon. It's, uh, we're incorporating the latest edits and we have uh, a table showing the, the area of each of these benthic habitats by country using the exclusive economic zone. And, and I think that's a great idea where we collect all the edits over one year and then we integrate all those edits and we create a new version. So this is the version that we have is, is for 2020 or 2021 or whatever we want to call it. And then the next year we do another update. So we do, we do yearly updates and we could, we could run the numbers and have that information available uh, to download but uh, that's, that's a great suggestion because I, I know there are people that want those numbers mm -hmm. and, and we can integrate these, these expert uh, review feedback polygons, update the numbers, and then provide that to you all on a, I think on a yearly basis, we could, we could at mm -hmm. least do that. Thanks Maria for your question. Um, okay, we have some more in the Q&A box. Um, the next question is, how about identifying pollution, sunken boats, debris uh, blown into the sea following a hurricane? Um, are there comparisons for before and after these kind of impacts? So that, that ability is definitely there. Uh, what we have budgeted for and produced is, is a compilation of satellite images uh, that were acquired between 2018 and 2019, and we've classified that. So, so the, the Dove satellite constellation acquires images every day. So you can go into the, the Planet uh, Archive, the Planet Library, and you can, you can choose and you can see uh, you know, different scenes from different days. You can select the best scene. And you can do detection like this. You, if, there's, if there's a flood event and there's, there's a big plume that's coming from a river, you can go and, and uh, look at the Planet Archive. Of course, uh, this product is not free. You've got you've to purchase it. But the, the ability to do that is there. Um, I, I believe you can purchase the imagery right there on the Dove uh, satellite uh, site. The, the planet satellite um, uh, library, but that ability to detect things like pollution, uh, uh, debris, it's at a four meter resolution, is there because it's collecting imagery every every day. And, and sometimes they don't put the images on because there's too many clouds, there's an algorithm that filters them out, but that capability is there. We're, we're not gonna be doing that uh, maybe we'll do updates over time, uh, but based on funding availability, but, uh, but, but we won't have a product that comes out on a consistent basis that, that does updates based on new imagery. Great. Um, so the next question that we have is, um, do agencies like the U.S. Um, Fish and Wildlife Service or NOAA's um, National Marine Fisheries Service, um, have they expressed their support for use of these maps um, for things like the Endangered Species Act or essential fish habitat consultations or anything like that so far? I'm not, no, uh, we haven't worked with them, and, but that's something that we'd like to do. We have a, a presentation I think next week <clears throat> for a, a group of agencies in Puerto Rico, and that's something that we can explore. Uh, these these are ecological baselines that that would support their objectives, and so that's that's a collaboration that that obviously we we welcome and, and would like to foster. So um, a lot of the the U.S. territories have have uh, resources, technologies to do to go above and beyond what what we're able to do with these Dove satellite maps uh, using. You know, multi-beam uh, sonar. Uh, there's products that, that can map deeper than what we're able to do, but uh, the, the product that we have is 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 a consistent product ac across a big geographic area, 
And so it, it serves its its role in that, but I'm sure there's there's information that that could be useful and we'd love to try to talk about that and explore opportunities for, for anyone that's interested in using these data sets. Awesome. Um, the next question is asking, um, are the data currently available or when will the data be available? Um, the question says in KML, and I'm not sure if you, if you know. Yes. Um, so this story map has satellite imagery derived maps, which I focused on, but we also have airborne derived. Um, so those are available as KML. Um, the, the benthic habitat maps aren't yet, but if that's something that would be useful um, for you all, um, I can work on converting those. Great. And they also asked, will you eventually be adding mangroves to this data set? Yeah, so that's that's the next thing we would like to do. Uh, there's a lot of products out there like the Global Mangrove Watch uh, at a 30 meter, which integrates optical and radar uh, uh, active uh, imagery to detect mangroves. But we'd like to see what, uh, we've done some manual digitization efforts of mangroves throughout the region using high resolution imagery. But we'd like to take a consistent approach to use these, these image, uh, this image mosaic to extract, to run the segments to, this whole process was done using an object-oriented classification. And we have these objects and we can try to train the algorithm to recognize mangroves and, and use uh, resources like the Global Mangrove Watch to, to guide where to select. Um, a lot of these narrow mangroves, these fringing mangroves, they fall out at a 30 meter resolution and you, you can't detect them. The rule to detect something with remote sensing is, it, it needs to be at least double the dimension of the pixel to be able to, to identify it. So these, these 30 meter products are only identifying mangroves that are at least 60 meters in, its small, in their smallest dimension. So that's a lot of mangroves we're missing. So we, we want to refine that and, and use, use the Dove imagery to, to map these out. And that's something that we're gonna work on this year. We actually have recently received funding to do that, so. That will be really exciting to add those in. Um, the next question that we have is, um, are there any plans to generate maps for other Caribbean islands that were not, are, are not currently covered? So beyond the insular Caribbean, uh, uh, we have just finished Florida and, and we're actually working on areas of Mexico and Belize. Uh, so we, we do have the imagery for this. It's just a, the, the funding availability. So we are working on the Mesoamerican Reef and we wanna uh, reach out with partners who have field data to guide uh, the, the accuracy of these maps. But uh, in the immediate future, uh, we have extended beyond the insular Caribbean to Florida. And in the next three or four months, we're gonna have Mesoamerican Reef finished, but that's that's the only plan right now. Great, thank you. Um, a question from Michelet Louis um, from the Biodiversity Directorate of Haiti. Um, said, I would like to know how TNC could help us in terms of capacity building on cartography and marine biodiversity. Cartography. Well, um, <laughs> Wait, that might not be the best exact translation. It came in in yeah. French. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, you know, these what what's in terms of being able to print these maps out, um, Val, can you do that on the app or? Yeah, uh, um, on I think the best way to do it from from this site is to use the feedback web map and there's a button at the top that says print with legend um, and it'll give you a pdf map okay other than that i mean downloading the data and bringing it into to a software uh, like qgis or arc pro and and creating your own maps um, but if there's if there's specific things that that you need uh, you know contact us and and maybe we can build additional functionality into, into the app. Um, we'd love to hear your ideas on, on doing that, but um, uh, yeah. Great. 
great, thanks. Um, one question came in, asks, how are these maps the same or different from the Allen Coral Atlas? I was waiting for that question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So, so the Allen Coral Atlas is a global effort, right? And they're using the same satellite. And they're doing an amazing job of uh, doing this at the global scale. It's, that's going to be transferred over to Greg Asner and Arizona State University. It's moving from Vulcan to his lab. And uh, he'll, be, he'll be taking care of and maintaining that, that resource. But uh, they're using a total automated method. Uh, they're doing all their work in Google Earth Engine. And, and uh, they're using object-based uh, classification. Uh, they have a little different classification scheme than we do mapping at a global scale. Uh, we've integrated some, some of the geomorphic zones like reef crest, fore reef, and back reef into our classification. We've mapped out dredged areas uh, because that was something that was um, suggested as an important class to know. Um, but we, the, the main difference I think is we've taken a much more manual approach in, in fine tuning and, and really reviewing these maps and, and trying to uh, you know, when, when, you, when, we, when we just look at the automated outputs, we were missing a lot of reefs, a lot of smaller patch reefs. And so we went back and we, we added those in manually because we could see them, but the algorithm wasn't picking them up. Uh, we've done some tweaks with the seagrass um, and identifying spur and groove. That was, that was a real more hands-on manual approach. So the diff main difference is it, it's, it's much more uh, customized and manual uh, catered to the Caribbean than, than the Allen Coral Atlas. So uh, I'll just leave it at that. There's, there's global data sets that we can assess uh, features at a global scale. And the Allen Coral Atlas fills that role. And then if you want to go down to more of a regional country level um, where you've had the luxury and resources to take more time to refine the product and, and get expert input, then then the, these maps um, fit that category. Thanks, that was a really good explanation and hopefully that makes that a little bit more clear for people. Um, so this next uh, question came in French and, and we um, tried to translate it. So hopefully um, it comes across. Um, is it possible to put already delimited shape files on the application to make maps? Uh, yeah, um, you, when you download the products, Val, are, there, are they rasters? Um, so initially we posted them as raster. And then when I posted the update yesterday, um, I posted them as vector because that was some feedback that we heard that vector was preferable. Um, so, so you have dissolved them uh, into a vector mm -hmm. format. Okay. Yep. Okay. So, um, so you should, those, those are in geodatabase format? Yes. Okay. So maybe that, you know, in QGIS, you, you can now open up a geodatabase. Mm -hmm. so, so if you want to convert those to, if you need shape files, uh, you, you should be able to do the conversion in QGIS, uh, but, but you should be able to uh, take those geodatabase dissolve geodatabase vector files and open them up in, in, in Q. You'd, originally, we had put everything in shape files um, in the past, but now that QGIS supports geodatabase, um, you're able to download those and open them up. Anything else you want to add to that, Val? Uh, no, I think that's right. Um, I guess maybe contact me directly if you need a different format um, for your purposes. Yeah, but I think uh, having them available in KML is a great idea. Mm -hmm. the, the keyhole markup language, that's, that's the native uh, format for Google Earth uh, vector files. Yeah, we can definitely do that. Got on my list here. <laughs> and thanks, you, you guys actually answered uh, my next question for you, which was whether they're available <clears throat> to download as vector files. So I think we answered that question as a yes. Um, so then um, we actually have a hand up. So I'd like to ask John Knowles to go ahead and John and talk. Hey, Oops. hopefully you can hear me. 
Yes. Hey, John. Hey, John. Great presentation, guys. I was I was just wondering, um, in terms of like the international policy arena, um, if y'all have any immediate steps working with um, <clears throat> uh, a SPAL protocol, GCRMN, and then um, post 2020 biodiversity framework and, and getting that data into to the work that's going on there. That That's the exact uh, trajectory that we wanna head to. And, uh, you know, working with with you and, and others, you know, these, these products came out in December. Um, we did, we did an update just this week with some expert feedback and, and we're, we have this paper that reports, uh, that basically defines the method so people can understand what kind of product it is. And we report the totals and the protection uh, estimates for each of the, the habitat classes. So now, now's the time to, to move in that, that direction and to start that dialogue. Uh, we, we wanna, you know, this, this, is, this is a big decade uh, for moving conservation forward. And so products like this will, will really help support uh, countries. And, and that's, that's the exact uh, discussion we wanna have. And so let's, let's uh, work towards that. Um, any, anything else, Val? You'd like to add? Uh, no, I think you covered it. Okay, uh, but but John, yeah, well, um, we need to talk about a strategy and how we can we can make this more uh, available to to the policy folks and and cater it so that they have the information that they need uh, to put it before the policy uh, decision makers. Thanks. Thanks, John. Okay, Jimena yeah, says, we will have other regional meetings with a more uh, policy audience. Yeah, so we're, we're gonna be planning on doing, hitting the policy crowd. Uh, yeah, thanks, Jimena. Yes. Um, and uh, I think one last question, unless others have more, please feel free to put in questions or raise your hand. Um, this last one that we have asks, how accurate are the bathymetric maps? Um, how, how accurate are the maps obtained by algorithms from the images? Okay, so that, that is based on the clarity of the water column and Zhui Li, uh, he's a, he's a uh, he works, he's on the faculty at Arizona State University he was the one that led a paper that we did uh, asking that question, how accurate is the bathymetry? And his results, we tested it in five different areas uh, and, and we used a lot of very accurate field data. His accuracy came up with a root mean square error of plus or minus about 1.83 meters. And, and so that's, that's pretty good for space-based uh, depth estimation. It's based on the the light attenuation uh, within the water column. And obviously that's gonna change depending on how, how deep it is, but it, you're more accurate in the shallow areas. And then once you get beyond about 12 meters, the accuracy starts to degrade. So that's, that. you can read more about that paper. Um, uh, just Google Dove uh, bathymetric uh, maps. And I'm sure you'll find the, the article, but it, it goes through the method that he used and and the accuracies. Great, we have um, one uh, more like a comment that just came in, um, but uh, is just asking um, that uh, people are notified um, when maps are updated so that they could download the newer zip files. I don't know if you had plans, plans for that along with your plans for updating the maps over time. Yeah, so on that survey form um, where you fill out your name and affiliation and download the maps, um, we do ask for your email there. So for this first update that we did yesterday, I'll, I'll send everyone an email. And then I think from now on, I'll just add um, an opt-in kind of button for email lists. That sounds great. Are there any other questions from the audience? Take a moment to see if anyone has any last minute burning questions. 
Yeah, I, I'd like to just uh, remind everyone of those those lessons. Those, le if you want to learn a little bit more and 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 do some exercises, uh, those those lessons are really useful. The online course there, uh, the remote sensing and mapping coral reef conservation course. Um, sign up at conservation training and and do those. Those are uh, very well thought through and and they have a lot of great examples. Thanks, Steve, for the lead in. <laughs> we wanted to share this. Um, can you see my screen okay? Yes. Yep. yes. Uh, we have this, uh, a list of some short resources for you of, of some um, of the websites that Val took you through today, the Caribbean marine maps.tnc.org. Um, there's also the Caribbean Science, Science Atlas. That's a good resource for this work at Caribbean Science Atlas.tnc.org. And I believe they link to each other. Yes, they do. Um, and then uh, this is the link uh, below for the remote sensing and mapping for coral reef conservation online course. Um, we also put it in the chat um, as well. Sherry put it in the chat. And um, as Steve alluded to, it's an online course, but uh, that has self-paced lessons, but we're actually going to host a mentored course version um, that's going to run from March 2nd to the 23rd. It's going to include three online, those three online lessons that Steve mentioned. There's a introduction, there's a lesson on the Allen Coral Atlas, and then there's a, a lesson all about the Caribbean marine mapping products. Um, and when we go over that last lesson on the Caribbean mapping products, Steve and Val are going to be the expert mentors for that um, as well. And we're going to have four webinars with expert mentors throughout that, um, that course. So um, registration is open and we hope to see many of you or, or some of you if you want to share this link out with partners or um, staff members as well. I just want to let you know that it's going on. Great. Is there a, a raised hand? Oh, can't see anymore. Sherry sent out a message. I wonder if it's too late. One second. Um, no, we still have time. Let me see if I can see the Q&A box. Well, I have my screen up. Let me take my screen down really quickly. There we go, Q&A. Um, yes, we do have two, um, two uh, let's see. So um, Julian Defoe, do you wanna go ahead and ask your question? Hello? Hello, yes. Defoe, how are you? Hello, Steve. Um, my sincere apologies from Dominica. We got really messed up, messed up with the, the time difference and, and other meetings because I saw February 11th and I took it to mean that 11, 11 o'clock, which is 12 o'clock in Dominica, but it was <laughs> And then well, um, I just heard somebody speak about how can your work link to um, existing um, policy initiatives going on now. So we just also completed this morning, CARICOM had an informal session on the, um, what do you call it? Uh, SBSTTA uh, 24. So, um, so it was quite timely that you had that, but obviously I got mess, uh, mixed up. So I don't know if information will, can be sent to me via email as to the, the presentation and the relevant links that I saw to look at um, the maps. And yes, we have. We, you're in luck. We have it all recorded. All right, great. And um, I also, um, unfortunately, um, I think Sherry had requested from Dominica um, some bathymetric data that we have, and we collected through LIDAR recently under the World Bank project. And um, I want to say this: this data is available, but also for the moment, um, we are looking at ways in which it can make, it can become useful to us instead of being a lot of huge files with lots of numbers because I don't know anything about that. that. That's that's what we do. We try to turn uh, data into information. Yes, yeah, so, so we have all this yeah. valuable data. So I don't know if I have to work with the existing project, which is still ongoing, and collect that data because you're going to go into some maybe copyright issues and so on since some millions were spent to collect it. Yeah, well, um, let's, let's talk about that. Um, yeah, so yeah, I'd be glad last, to help last you. Last time with the discussion with Sherry, I didn't have this data. But no, I do have it, you know, but I want to be open and transparent and say that, yes, while I do have it, it's not something that I can just pass on. So I, will I understand. Be investigating, I will be investigating in, in the protocols in how that can be done. And if it can okay. Be done. Okay. Let's, let's talk about that. Um, 
but I'm I'm glad that uh, you were able to join it, uh, and and uh, we'll we'll forward on the the link to the recording so you can you can watch the entirety. Uh, yeah, of thank the, you, Steve. You bet. Thank, good to hear from you. Yes, we'll be able. We will be sending the recording out to everyone after this call. Um, and Val uh, put her email, um, caribgis at tnc.org, um, for anyone to follow up with her after. And then we have one more hand up. Um, Anselino Davis, would you like to go ahead and ask your question? Yes, thank you. And hello, everyone. It's good to see your faces. Um, I've, uh, I, I've interacted with you all for a long time. Um, so in the Bahamas, firstly, for the document that y'all shared with the Science Direct link, we're hitting a paywall. And for the Bahamas, like right now, I, if you guys could maybe share the actual PDF when you send out the recording, that would be great for us to actually um, be able to read that. The second thing is when I was doing my work with remote sensing, we had a lot of issues. This is more of a technical thing. We had a lot of issues with shallow water, with the Bahamas water being so clear, making that distinction between what is a shallow sandbank and what is a shallow sandbank with like a foot of water above it. it. There wasn't really much difference in the reflection or we couldn't distinguish between them. Did you have that difficulty? And maybe if you could highlight some of the other differences that you had between like the Bahamas and the like more steep edge islands or anything that's like particular to different yes things? yes hey you know um it's it's Dr. Davis now right congratulations <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah all right um well uh we did have that that difficulty the Bahamas has incredibly clear water and what you're describing was exactly what what we encountered um, in the Turks and Caicos and also in the Bahamas, where if it got to like one meter, uh, we, we, the depth uh, algorithm kind of fell apart. And, and so that is, that is a limitation. And in a lot of those areas, we had to do manual corrections and, and include those back in because they were, they were being excluded. So that, that is a limitation and where you, where you, when it gets so shallow that the algorithm gets confused and it, it has a hard time. Once you go beyond about two meters, you're okay. But that, that two to one meter when it's really clear is very difficult, especially when it's, when it's a sandy bottom. Um, so that, that, that was an error and that, that's one that we had to correct for. And I'm sure there's more corrections we have to do. So um, I received uh, some good feedback from uh, Craig Dahlgren, and we're incorporating some of those those edits. So we'd love to get your feedback because I know you've done a ton of field work, and uh, take a good hard look at these maps and and you know identifying hard bottom versus soft bar bottom in some of these shallow areas like the west side of Andros was was difficult. So yeah, I was uh, yeah. I was particularly interested in the the sand flats for bone fishing. And I think there, there are some partners that would be interested in actually um, really mapping that stuff out. Yeah. Well. And, and I think there's a lot of opportunity for collaboration there. And I'm yeah. not sure how it works throughout the, the rest of the Caribbean. Yeah, so we have the original objects that were extracted from the, the uh, images. So with those, the best way is using that, those, the feedback polygons, describing the error, you know, spatially mapping the polygons, that goes into a central database that we can use and, and refine it. So we've tried to make it as easy as possible to collect expert feedback who know, everyone knows their backyard the best. And so, so uh, this is a big area and we really rely on, on experts to give us that knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, Lena. All right. Okay, I think that um, is all of the questions that I see. Um, again, I think um, you can reach out to um, Steve or um, Valerie with uh, additional questions. Um, and I put up the resources slide again so that you can access the Caribbean Marine Maps website where you can access and download the maps directly. And with that, I 
just want to thank again, um, Donna, Steve, and Val for your really excellent presentations. And thanks everyone for joining the webinar um, and, and participating with your great questions. Um, and we'll be sending out the recording shortly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks.